All right, today we're going to be talking about backend APIs. In part one, we're going to be covering why third party APIs within the backend framework, exploring your API. We're going to be utilizing the noun project for this lesson, setting up an API app, interacting with third party APIs, handling secrets within your Django project. And then in part two, we'll talk about formatting uh, these responses, changing models to account for type icons and testing third-party API requests. At this point, does anyone have any questions over anything that will be covered today? All right, just a friendly reminder, if anybody does have any questions at any point in the lesson, please raise your hand or send your question on the Whiskey, on the Whiskey Questions channel. Let's go ahead and take a look at our slideshow here. So third-party APIs, why third-party APIs? So it's important to continue to utilize the dry and SRP uh, concepts. And in this case, we, we now want to add the work smarter, not harder principle, right? Uh, if there's already an API that's doing uh, or handling the information that we need, why make that functionality ourselves? For example, let's say I'm making an application that's handling stock trade, all right? There's plenty of APIs out there that can give you a live feed on stocks, but more than likely they require some sort of API key to be able to access them. So that's a perfect example of what kind of API you wanna actually utilize in your backend framework. So now here's the flow of how third party APIs are going to work, right? So we have our own, um, our own API. It seems like the user sends a request for getting an image for a lamp. Okay, that goes over to our RESTful API framework. So our EC2 instance that's actually delivered on the web somewhere. And then after that, it gets delivered to our server, which is our API views. We've already went over this, right? How do we can create a method for our API class base view and pass in a parameter such as name? Well, this name parameter is going to be representing LAMP and the server is gonna say, well, I wanna grab an image. But instead of us saving a bunch of images into our database for you know, no purpose, we could find some sort of third-party API that maybe serves us with better images. So instead of actually communicating to our database and running some sort of query, we're just gonna send that request over to another site on the internet. That site will then go into images slash LAMP. They will grab their lamp from their database and they'll return that to our server, which will return to our response. It's essentially just saying, I don't want to do this work, so I'm going to pass it off to you. Does everyone understand this so far? Or does anyone have any questions regarding this, this kind of flow here? Okay, again, the user makes the request goes over to our EC2 instance, which is deployed. It will then communicate to our server. Our server will say, well, I don't need to communicate with my own database because I'm gonna send this somewhere else. It sends the request to another site like the Pokey API. The Pokey API then runs its views, grabs the image for whatever Pokemon it is that we wanna grab, returns it back to our server, and then our server returns that back to the client and never touches our own database. All right, <clears throat> so here we are in kind of a little bit more advanced way of what we're about to see. Uh, we can see our own path is taken in the variable here, right? And it's gonna grab an image, we gave it a name, and that's going to attach to a view that's going to utilize the request library to get some information. So request is quite literally only built to send requests through Python. But it gives us a little bit more than just sending a request. It gives us a way to easily authenticate ourselves with different um, with different backend servers. So, for example, if you're working with an API such as Google, you'll have to utilize requests, and you'll have to utilize an OAuth functionality, which will be covered today, in order to authenticate yourself. And that's essentially why we're utilizing requests now. Axios is fully JavaScript. And if you're trying to do something through Node, you may be able to utilize um, Axios to also access the OAuth permissions. Uh, but today, since we're working with a Django backend, we'll be utilizing Python requests. All right. 
does anyone have any questions or anything covered in this slideshow? All right, it doesn't seem like there are any questions. So let's actually start putting this into some practical application. <clears throat> so the first thing we're gonna, we're gonna go over is exploring your API. We're actually gonna take a look at the noun project here. So here's the noun project. Let me go ahead and copy this and share this with us on the chat. And then I'll also share it on our Slack channel. That way everyone has access to it. And I believe this is gonna be my first time making an account here. So we'll all go through this process together. So I'll go into join. It's gonna ask me for my email address or password. All right. Let me actually try to log in first. Okay, definitely don't have an account. So let's do this. We're gonna go ahead and create an account here. Don't need that. <clears throat> I do need that. All right, and let's create my account. There is already an account for this email. Okay, sounds good. Let me go ahead and sign in with Google then in that case, take the easy way out. Okay, there you go. So I'm inside of my account. Now that I'm inside of my account, I could take a look at my API docs, but let's actually just explore their user interface that they have here. So it tells me that they have icons and photos for everything. Well, if they have icons and photos for everything, I wonder if they actually have everything. <clears throat> I'm gonna go ahead and click the search bar here. Well, if I place everything, this is, these are the icons that it shows us. All right, essentially they provide us with icons for any sort of noun that we would like to see. Can anybody, does anybody have a noun that they would like me to throw in here? Ninja. Let's check out some ninja. Oh, that's how you spell ninja. All right, there it is. Now we can see some ninja icons there. You can try looking up people's names. Let's see what happens if I look up at them. Never tried this one. Well, there's Adam. Comes up with a couple of Adam and Eve references. We get the, the apple there as well. But essentially, you can find almost anything inside of this noun project. <clears throat> and this is really cool. And you, you can see that you can do some quick view. You can click on get this icon so that you can actually download it and utilize it. But this seems like a really inefficient way to interact with something that you want to include in your site, right? You don't want to go through the process of downloading every single one of these icons, putting them all inside your project, and then figuring out a way for Django to reference them. So there's gotta be an easier way. Well, up here on their nav bar, we can see that they have some API. If I click on this API and I click on get started, it's gonna take me to their developer keys. So here I have a key from Tango Platoon. Let me go ahead and create another application. So what is this application called? I'm gonna go ahead and say whiskey. What they do is the best code. And then I'm gonna generate some API keys. All right. So here I am within my project of whiskey. It tells me how many calls I've made. It looks like I have a limit of 5,000 calls. Uh, I'm not sure if that's daily. Uh, nope, that's monthly. So monthly I get 5,000 calls. Um, here's my historical data for the last 24 hours. <clears throat> and down here, it gives me a little bit of key management. Awesome. That's great. But I don't want to just grab these keys and go straight into some key management. I actually want to start 
looking at some documentation, uh, maybe taking a look at their pricing as well, and how to manage these apps. So let's start backwards. If I go to manage apps, it just takes me to this page up here. I guess it's not really what I wanted. All right, here we go, documentation. So here in my documentation, we can see that we have some getting started, how to create an API key, how something to work me through, authentic through authentication, how to make requests, pretty much anything that I need is right here in my API documentation. I can see the three headers. Well, I'm getting started with your API. So let me take a look at what getting started tells me. Walk me through how to create an API key, which we already have that. We have it down here. And then it tells me that in order to authenticate, I will have to utilize OAuth 1 to be able to authenticate my API key. Well, what exactly does that mean? I guess we'll have to find out here shortly once we actually start making our request. So let's keep scrolling down as far as like what OAuth 1 brings to the table. So here they have a pretty good example for making requests. After authenticating, you may uh, you can make a request to make to make a request. Uh, you simply need to point to http API projects the noun.com and it's really that simple. Nice. So here they have a list of all their public endpoints that we can utilize. They have an API explorer, which that's pretty cool. And then it looks like they have some sample code. So let's take a look at this here. Uh, this looks like it's my list of API calls that I can make. <clears throat> so here it's telling me that I can send get requests to that link right there and it's the blacklist. Um, I can grab things from an ID. Here it gives me a couple of other things so I could report something if I wanted to. I just need to post and send a report. And it looks like the data that they should carry is the icons information. Well, as we scroll down, we can see that there's quite a bit of different parameters and things we can do for grabbing icons. So here we go, getting icons. So I can get an icon, icon by the integer ID. Or, nope, oh, that's it. Let's see. So icon, integer ID should be able to grab it by string as well. So here down below, we can see that it sends the icon with the query parking. And that gives me my, uh, <clears throat> my icon for parking lots. So it tells me that you can, you can also use it with string, which is weird because up here it only says to access by integer. So I'm assuming if you want to access one individual thing, you have to do it by the integer. But if you want a list, you could do it through string. Okay, that's good to know. Let's take a look here at the playground as well. So here's my API playground. It tells me how to utilize my API key and my secret key. So let me grab this real quick. Here is my key. That's not it. And then here's my secret key. Well, now what if I wanted to take a look at some icons here? Let's see, the only icons that I have available, let's say if I wanna get an icon, it gives me a parameter. So what is it that I want to grab? Well, let's try Adam, just like we did before. And let's limit it to five. I don't need a thumbnail size or any other sort of information. Okay, so we see that a request URL was sent to, this is the URL that the request was sent to. It shows me the icon with the query, and then it shows me what it generated. So here's some icons. Um, it shows me the creator. And here's the thumbnail URL. So this is essentially what I'm going to be looking for once I once I start interacting with this API. 
and there's the thumbnail URL. Great. So I'm able to essentially grab out of this request because we know this is going to be in the body of the request. I could, I'm going to be able to get into the body and find this thumbnail URL to open it up or return it to my front end application. Great. I think I've done a, enough exploring as far as what I need in order to be able to grab my information. Um, I could take a look at their pricing as well if I really wanted to. This is important right here, actually. So here it tells me these are the supported HTTP responses that I'm going to receive. So it looks like I only have three possibilities for HTTP responses that they will provide. <clears throat> they will either provide a success, a 404 not found, or a 401 unauthorized. So this is going to return 404 not found if it can't find an icon or may return extra error description and response body. Okay, that's good. So I could take a look at the response body to kind of take a look at what's going on, what's causing this 404. Um, and this 401 unauthorized can also provide description into the body, but I know that because it's a 401 unauthorized, that would have to do with my authentication method. Okay, we've taken a look at the docs for a pretty good amount of time now. Does anyone have any questions over how to explore the noun project or what things you should look for within your APIs? I'm pretty familiar with this API, which is the reason why I knew exactly where to find everything. It's not typically this easy to be able to find all the information that you need. So I just want to point it out, if you're working with some sort of API and you're trying to grab some information and you just can't seem to find it, that's normal. Uh, sometimes searching it up on Google, somebody on Stack Overflow will have a link to the specific portion of the API that you need. Um, just recently, I was working with YouTube and I couldn't figure out what was going on with um, how to actually get my application to speak to YouTube. I ended up doing a Google search and another developer on Slack put a link to the Python library that interacts with YouTube. So you go there and it shows you all the repositories, how each individual function and method works for each class. So it's a, it, it takes a little bit of elbow grease to work with all your APIs. It's not always going to be this simple. All right. Well, now that I've taken a look at this information, I can take a look at their sample code. And in their sample code, they're generous enough to provide me a Python sample that I can utilize to actually authenticate myself. So it looks like I'll need request, which we talked about in our slideshow. That's going to be utilized to actually send a request. And we can see that it's the equivalent of Axios. <clears throat> Just like Axios.get works, we can run request.get and then pass in the endpoint that we want to ping it. So here's the endpoint that I'll be sending my request to. That's what gets referenced here. And in my authentication method, I am utilizing OAuth1 with my API key and my secret key to actually make this request. All right. So this looks like it's going to be the most useful bit about how I go into integrating this information into my API. So let's go ahead and start installing things and setting ourselves up as far as sending requests. So before we start writing code, why would I want to make my API calls from my server rather than making my API calls from my front end? Can anybody think of any sort of reasons why this would be preferred? Go ahead, Brian. Uh, protecting your API key. Yeah, so that's the that's one of the main focuses, security, right? Uh, security comes really into play, as we saw yesterday, or excuse me, not yesterday, but Friday, when we were talking about hiding our API keys in the front end. Uh, you can't really hide things in the front end. If you take a look at the source code, you're going to be able to find it. And just like Adam said at the end of that demo, uh, majority of the time, the rule of thumb is going to be anything on the browser is not safe and it's not secured. While everything living in your server is definitely going to be secured and can be hidden a little bit better with some extra security layers inside of your deployment instance. Then there's the authorization and authentication factor. 
not all APIs will allow you to communicate with them from a front end application. Kind of like a uh, Flask, right? When we try to ping Flask from our HTML template, our HTML template was a front end application. It might have been running locally, but it's essentially a front end application. And we saw that when we set that request, we got a course error. And that course error was saying, hey, we can't speak to this source that's trying to send us a request. There's a, gonna be a lot of times where you'll run into, into APIs where you'll start getting that error in your front end app. And, you, and it's kind of confusing because all it tells you is, hey, there's a course error, but it doesn't tell you that what the API is actually enforcing is that it's only able to do server to server communication. And it's not able to do front end application to server communication. Uh, and then there's just abstraction and reusability. The same, this, the, the, there's a couple of other reasons that you can see in our curriculum, but those are the two main ones that we want to concentrate on. We want to make sure that things are secured by staying in our, in our Django framework. And we want to make sure that we have a server to server communication, just in case our API does not allow for a front end to server communication. All right. So let's do a little bit of setup here. I'm gonna interact this API, but I don't want this to just live in any app. Typically what you wanna do is you wanna set up an app for all of your API requests that stands alone. So I'm gonna go ahead and run, I'm gonna change directory to my backend. And then I'm going to start an app named API app. All right, I've made a new app named API app. How do I tell my Django project that this app exists and that I could use it for any sort of calls? Add it to your installed apps. Nice, so I'm gonna go ahead and take a look at my installed apps in settings.py. I'm gonna come down to install the apps and I'm gonna add API app into install the apps under settings.py. Okay, good. So now it's able to communicate and talk to my API app. What about routing? How do I get my routing to get set up for this API, right? I wanna make sure that if I receive a request through my URLs, it goes into my API app. Go ahead, Adrian. We have to add a path in the settings or the URL. Yeah, so if I go to my URLs, I come down here, I have all these paths already made. I have one for my Pokemon and I have one for my moves. So now I'll make one for my API app. So I'm going to say V1 noun and this is going to go to include and it's going to include the api app.urls all right so what is this line saying this line is saying that when i receive a request at localhost slash api slash v1 slash noun it's going to route this URL or the remaining of this URL to API app to the file URLs. But there's something missing here. What am I missing? What's the next step for linking these, these uh, URLs? Go ahead, Jose. Uh, do something similar for the... Um... Uh, the actual move, or I me mean, sorry, the uh, the app that you created in the API app. So you need a URLs.py file. Nice. Yeah, I'm going to need a URLs.py file from Django.urls. I'm going to import path. And then I can make some URL patterns. And this URL patterns will take in path at an empty string and it will attach to a noun project class as view with the name of 
noun API. All right, <clears throat> so that's all I have for now. But currently this noun project doesn't exist. Where does this class based view exist? Where am I supposed to make it? Go ahead, Edge. Uh, you would create that in your views.py or file? Yeah. So I go into views.py. I'm going to make a class noun project. All right. We know that we want this to be a get request. So actually, instead of pass here, I'm going to write a get request or a get method that will accept self. And that's all I'm going to do for now. All right. There's quite a bit of missing things here. So I know I'm not going to need this part. But this class right now seems to just be regular OOP. How do I turn this into an API view? Go ahead, Tom. Do we grab the, the REST framework uh, API view and inherit that into the noun product? Yeah, so we'll go from REST framework dot views, import API view. And we'll also need a response. So let's go from REST framework dot response, import response. All right, let's go API view. Well, now that this is an API view, what other argument is this get method supposed to account for? Nathan? Um, I'm not sure. Let me, I'm like looking at my notes. Yeah, I'm gonna have to phone a friend on this. All right, no problem. It looks like Saul has his hand up if you wanna let him take it. Yep. All right, is it gonna take in self and in response? Close, it's not gonna take in response. It's going to take in request. Nice. So now we have this get method. And now what do we need to return from this method? Go ahead, Tom. We need to return a response of some kind with the, um, like the, the content that we want to display from our. Ah, so let's do icon URL. We'll go here. All right. <clears throat> so there we go. We've connected everything. We have our URLs. That's going to include the API app URLs. It goes to the API app to URLs, but there's something missing here. I can see that. It tells me, hey, this doesn't exist. What am I missing in this file? Natalie? Sorry, we have to, I think, well, the noun project, we have to import it. Nice. Yeah, so I'm going to say from dot views, import noun project. All right. It's going to get to this empty path, go over to our views, and return a response. All right. Looks like everything is working pretty well. Let's go ahead and take this noun project out for a spin. Let's make sure that it's working. So it's going to go to API slash V1 slash noun. And that's it. I'm going to run the server. Good. My server is running. And when I send this get request, I get this icon URL will go here. Good. Everything's working great. I'm able to grab my information and it sends back the correct response. 
Well, now let's start building out our functionality here. So just thinking from the URL perspective, I want the user to be able to give me what they're looking for, right? So I need to grab what it is they're looking for. So how do I add that into my URL patterns so that I can actually accept parameters? Go ahead, Nathan. Uh, would it be like the include? Do you have to import the path and include? It's close. Um, instead of utilizing include, we're just gonna go ahead and add a parameter argument here. All right. So it would do string and let's do, I guess I'll just say name and close it. So now that I've added this string name, what needs to change in my method or my get method here? Because it's no longer just accepting self and request. Go ahead, Donnie. Uh, you need to grab that string. So you need to throw in a name or whatever it will be. Nice. Yeah, so we'll add a name in there. And now we could do name. So name icon will go here. So now I have my URL there, and I'm going to add, oh, I don't know, shell. Let's do that. Oh, I'm not running my server, which is the reason that request felt. But now when I send the request, we can see it actually grabs shell out of my URL pattern and says the icon will go here. Good. So we've built out the majority of our functionality. But now we actually need to start interacting with our third-party API. Well, there's a couple of things that we need for that. One, we need something to actually be able to send requests, which is the equivalent of Axios. And then we need something to authenticate within the request. So I'm going to hit install requests. Request will be utilized to send request. And I will pip install request underscore OAuth lib. Now this OAuth lib is what's going to give me access to OAuth 1. Did I misspell something? Hit install requests OAuth lib. I don't think I misspelled anything. I think you're uh, here the U after you know. Yeah, so you I missed the U. That's good catch. Awesome. I missed the U in my original attempt. I just put O off instead of O off. So there you go. Now I got my O off lib. I'm within my my uh, views file. And I can start importing things. So the first thing I'll need to import is going to be request. And then I'll need to import, oh, say from request O off lib import. OAuth 1. There you go. Now I have OAuth 1. So now the next step that I need to do is actually take a look at my API and grab the information from said API. All right. So now to grab information from my API, I'm going to go ahead and come over and I could just simply copy and paste this straight from the noun project. And I'm going to place that into the body of my method. So now we can see I have my authentication utilizing OAuth1 and my endpoint for what I'm sending it. And then I'm going to grab a re response. Well, let's print said response as well so that we can take a look at that. And before I make any sort of request, I need to actually switch these out. I have my API key and my secret key. So let's grab those. 
going to come over to my app again, grab my API key. I'm actually going to make variables for these. I'm going to grab my secret key. All right. So now I can just switch them out. I'm going to reference my API key. And I'm going to reference my secret key. All right. Go ahead, Nathan. Yeah. So like you put the keys in there, is this considered like safe now or like are these environmental variables that would be difficult to like get from the front end? <clears throat> yeah, that's a great question, Nathan. And we're not quite there yet. We will be covering how to hide these inside of environmental variables. Right now they're just straight in our code. So though they're not safe. If I were to push this code up to GitHub, my keys would be visible and they would be exposed. And that's not gotcha. what Okay, cool. Thank you. Of course. All right, so now I have all of this information. I'm able to send a request to my endpoint. Well, this endpoint currently right now, it's pinging slash one. That's not what I want, right? If I remember correctly from the pro from the playground, oh no, where the playground go? Let's see. Looks like I've lost the playground, but if I remember from the API endpoints, let me take a look here. API Explorer. The one that I want is I want to ping icon and pass in an actual query, which in this case was shell. And let's just say limit one so that we just grab one. So it looks like this is the URL that we want to ping. I'm getting a 403 forbidden because I didn't put in my API keys, which is okay. This is what I actually need. So I'm going to take that URL here and place it within my code. All right, so now that I have this URL endpoint and within my code, right now the query that it's looking for is shell. This isn't really dynamic because if I were to pass something else in my URL pattern, it would still just look for a shell. So what do I need to change for this endpoint to account for a name? Go ahead, Jens. Um, so you would make that into an F string. And then that way you can replace shell with name. Awesome. Good. Now we have a fully functional URL pattern. We have my authentication key working. I'm able to send a request and I should be able to see a response. Well, let's see what happens. I'm gonna run my server. And actually before I run my server, I just installed two new things. So I may want to pit freeze into requirements TXT to update my requirements. So let's take a look at requirements now. So requirements now has request, request OAuth lib, and URL lib. All right, awesome. So I was able to update my requirements.txt to be able to place the correct information. Now let's run the server. The server is running and let's send this request. I still get the shake, the shell icon goes here, but now if we take a look at my print statement from response, I get this response 200. So it's telling me, hey, this response worked. You have your response. That's not really useful, right? It doesn't tell me much about it. Well, what if I look at response.content and I send this request? Well, within response.content, I can see that it pretty much gives me all of my dictionaries or the dictionary that I was actually looking for, right? Here's icons. It gives me the attribution of shell. And here's my thumbnail URL. But it's all within a binary string. This isn't working how I want it to. 
And it's going to be quite a bit of trouble to even read this and grab my information. Um, so what can I do to grab the content out of this response and turn it into workable information within Python? Go ahead, Donnie. Can we like, I don't know if we necessarily use a fixture, but if, can we like JSONify the data? Yeah, awesome. So I'm gonna actually JSONify the set data. I'm gonna run response.json. And now when I do this, and I send the request, we can see that the request comes back with the correct information and some actual JSON data. Does anyone have any questions over anything we've covered so far? Go ahead, Louis. Uh, I saw that in the, um, like we had to utilize OAuth 1 because it's how the API describes that we like the request or whatever, but like in the future, um, are there a lot of like weird little installs like uh, OAuth lib and things like that that we just need to look into depending on what our APIs are, or is that like a more common one, just out of curiosity? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, majority of the time, they'll utilize some sort of um, OAuth that comes from request OAuth lib. So as long as you have request and request OAuth lib, you should be able to import whatever authentication method they have. Um, another way that they do authentication is within the request headers. So you have to specify in the headers, this is my authorization token, and then place your token within the header. And that's how it will authenticate you. Um, there's a couple of other ways of authentications, uh, but we will talk about those when we get to our actual authentication class. Does that answer your question, Lewis? It does, yeah, thank you. Of course. Go ahead, Nathan. Yeah, so if, like, let's say this API had, like, a bunch of other stuff that you could access, would you put all those functions in the same view like in the class noun project and just kind of have a different function for like accessing different different things within the same api uh at that point if i'm utilizing the same api and the only thing that's changing because all, all we're going to be doing is sending get requests right yeah if the thing that's changing is the parameter as to what i'm paying within the api Rather than creating a class-based view, I would create function function-based views, and then each function would ping a different URL. Okay. Yeah, so kind of like what we did when we first started within Django, um, where we created these functions, right? I would have each individual function for each one of those purposes that you have, rather than utilizing a class-based view. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Of course. All right, so let's do a quick overview over what we've done so far. So far, we created a API app. We went into our settings.py and added this API app into installed apps. We then went to our URLs and within URLs, we added the API endpoint for API slash V1 slash noun, which included the API app.urls. Within API app.urls, we imported the noun project and created some URL patterns with the path for the that will account for a parameter of string with the key of name. From there, we went over to our views. I actually created our noun project view, which will work off of a get method utilize the API key that we grabbed from our API site or the documentation where it actually gave us this key and secret key. We then utilize OAuth to authenticate ourselves. We establish an endpoint that will be dynamic to account for the key of name in both the endpoint and the request. We then sent a get request utilizing requests and turned that response into JSON data. Again, does anyone have any questions over anything that we've covered so far? Go ahead, Natalie. Yeah, um, I have a quick question. So with the, before when we were printing out our response, we did response.content. How come we don't have to do response.content.json? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So that's kind of a um, hidden functionality of .json. So what .json does is it looks within the response and looks for any JSONifiable data. When it finds the content, which we saw was a binary string of JSON data, it says, oh, this is the JSON information that you want me to JSONify and return. So this .json is a function that will only return the content portion in a JSON format. Does that answer your question, Natalie? Yeah, thank you. Of course. All right. So now that I've taken a look at all this information, uh, let's take a step back and talk about security, right? So just like uh, I believe Nathan asked earlier, well, now I've made this API key variables within my own function, that's going to expose them as soon as I push them up to GitHub. So how do I hide them? Well, now we're going to start talking about secrets. So for secrets, I want to do something like starting a .env file. So now if I say ls here, we can see that I have all of these files. And if I run touch.env, we can see that an env file was created. And this env file is going to account for environmental variables. So I'm going to go over to my views. And I'm going to copy and paste these. Now, typically environmental variables, you want to place them inside of capital letters. So I'm going to say API key and secret key. So now that we're then environmental variables, but how do I prevent this file from getting pushed up to GitHub? Because Git's going to push anything within this directory up to GitHub. So how do I tell Git not to push this one file? Well, I'm going to make another file named git ignore. And this git ignore file is going to specifically tell git not to touch the following files. I'm going to tell it, hey, do not touch the .env file. So we could see that it got darkened after that. I'm going to tell it, do not push any pycache directories. And I believe that's all the unnecessary files that I have as of now. Perfect. So now I'm making sure that neither of these get pushed up. This is a directory, this is a file, and it's able to ignore both of those. Now you'll notice my git ignore lives at the same level as all of my other apps. Well, git is going to reference this git ignore first before it looks into any other files within this directory to make sure that it ignores the correct information. All right, so now I know this isn't getting pushed up into Git. But how does that work within my views? How do I hide this in my views? Well, the last thing we're gonna actually install today is going to be python.emv. So I'll run pip install python-.emv. Great. Again, I'll freeze. I'll take a look at my requirements txt to make sure that worked. So there it is, python.env, it worked correctly. And now within my views, to utilize it, I'm going to import .env values. So I'll say from, and actually, yeah, let's do from, dot emv import dot emv values now dot emv values is a function it's a function that's going to look for a dot emv file and load all of its keys and values as a dictionary so now i can say env is equal to dot emv values And I could pass in dot env. So I'm going to say, hey, at the parent level, you'll be able to find a dot env file. I want you to load it and place it as a dictionary. 
So let's take a look at what .env actually does. Let's print env. I'm going to run my server and send my request. And if I scroll all the way to the top, we can see that now I have an ordered dictionary with API key with the correct key inside of it. And then a secret key with the correct key within it as well. Great. Well, what does that mean for me? Well, that means that instead of establishing API key as such, I could do env.get API key. And I could do the same thing down below. env dot get and then here I'll place my secret key and send my request all over again. And now when I send my request, I still got my request. Everything worked just fine. I still got my entire response and I was able to authenticate myself. But now when I push this code to GitHub, my actual EMV file will never be exposed and there won't be any exposure of my keys within GitHub. So let's do a quick overview one more time. We created a .env file. We placed our API keys and secret keys in inside of them. We then created a .get ignore file that will ignore our .env file and our PyCache directories. From there, excuse me, everyone, give me a sec. Hey, folks. Um, All right, I'm back. Thanks. Oh, awesome. I was just going to check in on questions. Awesome. All right, so now we were able to hide that file. And within our file, we loaded the .env file to return an ordered dictionary. We then grab from that ordered dictionary by the key of API key. And we grab by the key of secret key to grab both of those secret keys. We then authenticate ourselves utilizing those environment variables. We ping our endpoint utilizing name as our dynamic variable. And then we send a request. We then turn that request into JSON, JSON data and we return a response. All right, that's quite a bit so far. Does anyone have any questions over anything that we've done up to this point? Go ahead, Donnie. Uh, yeah, real quick. Um, could you just simply explain what's the difference between this .env file and our virtual .env file that we use when we like create everything in the beginning? Got it. So the difference between this .env file is that the .env files it's supposed to store environmental variables, and it's and it's literally just a file. Um, the other thing that you're referencing to is your Python virtual environment. And your Python virtual environment is a, in charge of creating a development environment for this project. That's why it gives you Python, it gives you pip, and it's able to track any sort of request or modules that have been installed, right? You'll notice uh, some people have ran into yellow squigglies under things that they have installed. And that's because the virtual environment they're using, if you can see down here, VS Code is tracking that it's supposed to be utilizing the virtual environment within my .env directory. And here it tells me, it shows me where it lives. It lives in the directory environments at the parent level. The directory name within that is .env. Then there's a separate directory named bin. And inside of it, there's a Python file. And that's the one that it uses to execute, All right? One of them is a virtual environment while this is just an env file which stores environmental variables. Does that answer your question, Donnie? Yeah. Awesome. 
Any other questions? I see a question in the chat. So is the git ignore going to ignore all the PyCache files from the from all the apps? That's correct. The git ignore is going to ignore all the PyCache directories and all of the files within them in all of the different apps. Go ahead, Michael. So if we were um, making an app and we pushed it and then we wanted to make it available for other people to like utilize and they're gonna need this key, um, would we then just add in the readme like, hey, specific places where there's comments, like naming the file to say, hey, go here, put your own key in this spot, or how does that typically get done? Because, you know, somebody needs to download it and then implement their own key and you can't give them yours, obviously. Yeah, it's a, that's a great question. And actually, it's exactly what you would do. Um, you could provide them something like an example.emv file. And inside of that example.emv, you could have like the names of the keys and rather than having values you could have like addresses as to where they can get those keys or you could simply put it in the readme of hey if you want to utilize this this uh, script you're going to need to grab this key from this site and here's the steps for how to grab create your key and how to insert as an emv variable all right and you want to be very descriptive uh, but not too descriptive because if you're too descriptive, it can create problems depending on the machine, on the independent machine that everybody's on. But if you're not descriptive enough, um, you know, people won't be able to actually generate their own API key. So it's a hard balance to strike. And that's the reason why API documentation is so hard to read sometimes. Does that answer your question, Michael? Yes, thank you. Go ahead, Nathan. Yeah, so, but if you did push this up, we do have that requirements.txt, right? They could just pull that and kind of load it up in their own virtual environment. So they would have all the same, uh, like, versions of everything that we were using. Is that uh, kind of how that would work? Yeah, so that's the purpose of requirements.txt is to make sure everybody utilizes the same versions, but they won't have the same environmental variables. Gotcha. Awesome. Okay, great. Doesn't look like there are any other questions. The only other key that we do need to make sure we hide is going to be our um, Django key. So we've been pushing this up to GitHub quite a bit and we shouldn't have. Um, if we go into our project, moving forward from the very beginning, as soon as you start your project, it is very it is common practice to hide your Django secret key. So here we can see that I have a secret key for Django. I'm gonna copy that, take that over to my .emv file, and I'm gonna paste it. But instead of naming it secret key, I'm going to name it Django secret key. All right, and then here's where things get a little bit. Uh, weird, right? So we've created our .env file within our views here. I'm going to actually take it out of here and move it over to my settings. Now, the reason why I'm doing that is because the first file that ever gets executed when you run any sort of Python dot um, or Python manage p1, manage py, and then whatever command it is that you're about to use, it always takes a look at your settings.py first. So because it takes a look at my settings.py first, I want this emv or load.emv to happen within settings.py. In my views, I will then import it. I'll say from Pokemon project or Poke API project dot settings. I want to import EMV. So I'm saying go into the Poke API directory, go into the settings file, and bring in this EMV variable. But now I can also switch out my key here and say EMV dot get. Django secret key. 
And to make sure it all works, I'm gonna run Python, manage py, run server. All right, so my run server command worked, which means my secret key loaded correctly. If I send a request, my request works and I get my shell icon works here, along with my response in JSON data. And that is it. All of my secret keys have been hidden and I'm able to successfully load them. And I see you have a question from Yams, go ahead. Um, so going forward, hiding that Django secret key should be the first thing we do in production? Yes, before you push anything up to GitHub, always make sure that you hide the Django secret key and hide any sort of other environmental variables that you may have. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Of course. All right, awesome. We've been going for quite a bit. We covered quite a bit of ground. Um, this is a lesson that we don't have a middle assignment for. We wanna make sure that we go through this entire lecture. So currently right now it is 10.01. Let's go ahead and take a 15 minute break and come back at 10.16 to continue on with our lecture. Thank you so much, everyone. I'll see everyone in 15 minutes. All right, great. So, so far we covered quite a bit of information about what exactly we're doing with our Django API. And we're able to cover a, a third-party API now. We're successfully pinging them and hiding all of our EMV, all of our EMV variables. But what's going on here on this view, right? We got all this information, we got it all working, uh, but I'm not grabbing the right data. And if I take a look at my server, that's a considerable amount of data that I'm getting back. And it's not very easily readable. I can't really read this very well. So what can I do here as far as formatting my data in a better way? Well, now I'm gonna utilize something called pretty print. And this is unique to Jing or to Python as far as the way that it prints things into our terminal. So far we've utilized print and that's done the job for us so far. But sometimes what we need is something that can give us options for formatting information. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, I'm going to import pretty print. I didn't do any sort of extra installment that came straight from Python. I just needed to import it. And pretty print is actually just in, it has a class within it that you can utilize to create an indentation. And now that I'm thinking about it, it might be better if we do something like from pretty print import pretty printer, there we go. Yeah, that should work. If we do it this way, I believe. We could try it out. All right, so now I'm gonna go ahead and create an instance of this pretty printer class. And it's essentially going to take in the argument of how much I wanted to indent it. I wanted to indent by two. And I want to have it indent to the depth of two. We've seen something similar to this when we were working with our fixtures, right? I did dash dash indent two, and that told it, hey, I want you to indent by two to the depth of two. Well, how does this work whenever I'm working within my response? Well, I've made the class instance. Now, in order for this instance to work, all I need to do is pp.preprint response.json. And now when I send this request, oh, look at that. I got this generated at and these icons. Uh, we can see that now everything is formatted and it only goes to the second depth. After that, it cuts it off. All right, so let's say I wanted to enter icons. Let's uh, make this a little bit more readable. Let's say JSON response. And that's going to be equal to response.json. Now I can go into JSON response.get icons. Let's see what that returns when I send this request. Well, now when I go into icons, we can see that it gives me a list of dictionaries that have attributions 
collections, creator, ID, license, but more importantly, at the very end, I have this thumbnail URL. Good, and it looks like it gives me that for quite a bit, even though I sent the limit of one. So maybe the limit of one is reference to collections and not to one specific PNG file. Uh, but now what I can do is say, well, I want it from index zero because that's the very first one. And now when I send it, I should only get one dictionary. So now I scroll down to the bottom. I only have one dictionary being printed. And I can utilize docket to grab my thumbnail URL. I send my request and there it is. There's my thumbnail URL. If I go to copy this and I bring it over to my browser and I search it, that's the shell that comes back from the noun project API. Good. So now I just utilize pretty print to be able to iterate through my entire response. Does anyone have any questions about how to utilize the pretty printer instance or the class itself? Go ahead, Donnie. Um, feel free to not get into this, but I was just thinking outside the box. So say like, for instance, this now have multiple thumbnails. Is there a way to get like the length of how many responses you got for icons? Get the length of how many responses I got for icons? Uh, do you mean that from the API level or from the script level where we're at right now? Like where we're at, to just say like we wanted to return like from the URLs, a random one that matches that icon. Yeah, let's see. So if I take a look at how much came back from this from this dot icons, I believe that sends me back into the list. Yep, so there's my list. So if I wanted to do something to see the length, I could just run an LEN. And then when I send this request, it gives me that I got 16 icons back. All right, thank you. Of course, no problem. Was that along the lines of what you were looking for or were you looking for something different? No, exactly. That was, that's what I was looking for. Okay. So now I want zero dot get, and then I believe it was thumbnail URL. Okay, good. <clears throat> so now that works. Go ahead, Landon. I just have a question about the URL pass. Uh, like before we were describing like putting in a base or or providing parameters to that URL in the settings of the Pokemon project. Could you just kind of walk through where the name is getting passed from this URL patterns and where it's getting imported and then how it's pulling through? Yeah, definitely. So uh, I believe the, the question is how exactly does shell get to the view, right? Correct. Okay, awesome. So if I'm looking at this request, right? When this request is executed and I send that get request, the first thing to be receiving this request is 127.0.0.1 at port 8,000. And that's just running my Django application. So we'll go into my Django project. And inside of my Django project, they'll execute settings.py. Once settings.py is done being executed, it will then look at the URL patterns. And the URL patterns fall down here at the project level. Well, the remaining of that request falls under API, we can see that all three of these routes down here are API slash V1. So that's all common in all of them, but here's where they change. So this one has Pokemon, this one has moves, and here's now. So it falls into now. And after that, there's nothing continuing it, but I have this include. So it's going to try to include api.urls. So we'll look into API go over to the URL patterns. And here we can see I have this path that takes in a parameter through the URL named name. And it has a string time. So that's where shell gets executed. And then the, the, the class-based view that's going to be executed uh, corresponding to this path will be the noun project. 
view. So now we take a look at our class-based view of the noun project. We sent a get request. So that get request, we first take in the argument of self, which is referencing to the class. We then take in the argument of request, which is referencing to the request that it's actually going to accept. And then we have the argument of name. And name is the same as this name. So our URL parameter passes it to the class-based view. The class-based view passes it down to the method and gets executed as the key of name. And from there, we're able to utilize it within our code, however we wish to. Does that answer your question, Lando? Yeah, me, yes, it does in the, the get request or that uh, function that you have right there that is automatically triggering because it's like a special case you had said before? Or... Yeah, so we sent a get request here. So when this request gets uh, gets sent over to this portion here of the noun project dot as view, the dot as view method that belongs to the API view, will take a look at what kind of method it is that we're receiving. If we got a get request, it will trigger the specific function and return that response to this parameter. If it was a put request, then the dot as view would then choose the put request method and return that for the for this URL. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thank you very much for explaining that. Of course, no problem. <clears throat> all right, great. Well, now that we've made our URL, we have all this information. We're able to grab the correct URL. Instead of pretty print this, this path here, I'm just going to go ahead and copy this. I'm going to comment that out. And then I'm going to go ahead and say URL or icon URL is equal to grab that to the response. And all of my response is going to return is my icon URL. Great. Well, now let's send my request now. And now when my request comes back, I'm pinging my Django API, but it's returning the noun project URL path. And there it is. Just like that, we integrated a third-party API into our Django framework. Does anyone have any questions over what we've done up to this point? Yeah, so just to confirm, the pretty print is just for like developers, right? To kind of look at the data being returned. Yeah, it's just for us to work with data. That's all. It's okay. uh, it's just so that we could see what's getting printed into our terminal in a nicer format. All right. Okay, well, now that we have this information, let's go ahead and start actually writing some tests to make sure that this API communication is always working correctly. So I'm going to go over to my test.py. And actually, I believe we have a directory name test, but I think I have that within my Pokemon app. Yep. So I'm going to do it here in my API app. I'm going to go over to test. And here's where I'm going to write my test to make sure that this is working correctly. So now the test that we'll have to utilize is a bit different than what we've utilized up to this point. We'll have to import something named patch and we'll have to import something named API client. So before we utilize the client, but now we don't wanna mock the behavior of just a client. We wanna mock the behavior of an API client. So I already have test case up here. That's great. The next thing I'm gonna do is say from unit test, dot mock because I'm mocking this behavior, I want to import patch. And then I'm going to from rest framework dot test import API client because somebody's going to ping my API. So now we make our tests. So noun project test gonna pass in test case here. Now I'm going to create my setup method. Just in case we forgot, the setup method is just something that's going, a method that's going to be triggered 
before every single class. And this is where you can make class attributes. So for example, we're going to create a client, which is going to be in reference to the API client. And this API client is going to send requests just like our client did in our API views test before. Now we can't really, we're, we're writing a unit test to test our, our third party API. Now there's three types of tests. There's end-to-end -end tests, which is something like what we did with Cypress, which is testing the entire application, right? It's running your entire front end, making sure it's sending requests, receiving information, and it's checking the display of all that information. But that's actually working with the entire framework, right? You were We were using the Rick and Morty API as our backend framework before. Now we're using Django as our backend framework. So we can't do an end-to-end -end test. Uh, there's something called an integration test. An integration test is strictly front-end or something that pings both front-end and back-end, but doesn't test the entire end-to-end -end functionality of your site. And then the final test, which is what we've been concentrating on almost the entire cohort, except for React, is unit test. And a unit test is supposed to test the smallest level uh, without branching out or testing data from any other framework or API that we have. So now to keep this at the unit test level, we're going to write a test that will mock the behavior of our API. So I'm going to go ahead and make this test Pokeball image API view. It's going to take in self and it's also going to take in mock get. So now how does this work? Let's make our parameter here. My parameters is gonna be Pokeball. And my preview URL is going to be something like https slash slash example.com slash image. This preview URL really doesn't matter because it's just gonna be uh, what we, we pretend that it's going to return. All right, so this isn't what the what the uh, API is actually going to return. I'm just pretending this is the response that it's going to return. And this is where the pretending comes in. I want to create a mock response here. And this mock response is going to create a type. Again, I'm going to pass in mock response. But where does this mock response come from? All right, I'm calling a type of mock response, but I'm never telling it where it's going to grab this information from. Well, we'll see that here once we utilize this mock get. So this mock response is going to take in a function. And then it's going to take in what I would like to have as my response. So one is what data or what format is my data being returned? It's being returned in JSON. And I'm passing in a Lambda function, telling it for the following, you're gonna place them all in JSON format. So I should have something along the lines of icons. If we take a look here at my views, so we had an icons, which was a list, That list had an index of zero, and then it had a dictionary. So there's my list with a dictionary, and that dictionary is going to have a key named thumbnail URL. And that thumbnail URL is going to take in my example PNG from before. So here we go. I'm going to go ahead and pass in preview URL. So all I'm essentially doing in this line here of mock response is I'm creating the response that I'm receiving back from my API without actually pinging my API. So I know that my API, my API had a dictionary. That dictionary had a key of icons. So here's my dictionary. 
that dictionary has a key of icons. I can see that I entered index zero. So here's my list. And if I enter index zero, I have a dictionary. And then finally in that dictionary, I access a key named thumbnail URL. So here's my key, thumbnail URL, where I'm making sure the preview URL that I created is what's being returned there. All right, so I just created a fake response, but this fake response isn't being triggered just yet. Well, in order for this fake response to work, I'm going to ask mock get to return a value equal to mock response. And like I said, mock response is now a function because of this right here. Right, I created a type mock response, and this is what it does. It returns a JSON response with a dictionary with the key of icons and a list of dictionaries where each dictionary will have a thumbnail URL and the example that I provided it. Awesome. Well, now the last thing that I need to do is actually utilize patch. So up above, I imported that patch and patch is a decorator that I'm going to tell it, hey, this right here, anytime request sends a get request, instead of actually sending the get request, I want you to utilize the mock response down below. That's where this mock get happens. So the mock get will return the mock response value instead of actually sending the get method. Great. Now we can actually make sure this response works. So let's say response is equal to self.client.get. And I'm going to send a reverse. And I believe that comes from URLs. And that's going to go over to noun API. I need some arguments. So I'm going to say that my arguments is the ball that I'm looking for, which is a Pokeball. And then I'm going to run an assertion. I'm going to say with self.subtest because I want to test the uh, the status code first. I'm going to say self.assert equal. And for those of you who have encountered this issue already, Django has gone through an update process. So their test suite has different syntax. So instead of utilizing assert equals, please utilize assert equal. And I'm going to pass in response.status code. I'm going to make sure that that status code comes back with success 200. And if that passes, then the last thing I'm going to do is assert equal json.loads. Oh, I want to import json here. I apologize. I want to make sure that response.content is the same as my preview URL that I had before, because that's the only thing that should come back from this request. All right, this is a pretty big test. So let's break it down one more time and then we'll go over questions. So we have Django reverse, which will allow me to ping a URL path by its name. We have patch, which will allow me to uh, fake the behavior of request. I have an API client because that's what's making a request to an API. And then I have JSON to load the content of my request. I set up an API client. And then I tell my test that anytime request.get is triggered, that it's not going to actually run that function. Instead, it's going to mock my view. So now I give it 
create a variable named ball that's assigned to Pokeball. I create a preview URL, and then I run my mock response. So my mock response is going to send it to a type of mock response, which is going to be a either, a, it seems like it's a class in this case. And this class is going to essentially make the following into JSON data. The JSON data will be a dictionary named icons. This dictionary will have a key of icons, I apologize, where the value is a list of dictionaries. At index zero, we'll have a dictionary with the key of thumbnail URL and the value of preview URL. When my view is then executed, so once I say mock.get return value mock response, this is saying that I'm going to fake the get method or the get request for request. I will utilize mock get to fake that request. And what I wanted to return is the instance that I created of mock response. So now when this gets executed, it's going to grab my API key, my .emv key. It will then authenticate my, it authenticate this. It'll create the endpoint. But when it gets to this response part on line eight and it sends request.get, request.get won't actually get triggered because that's what's being patched. Instead, what will happen is this mock response will get returned and the return value of this request.get will actually just be the dictionary that I made in here. I will then turn that into JSON. From JSON, I will grab the key of icons at index zero and then grab the thumbnail. It should return the preview URL that we made here. All right. So the client sent the request to the noun project. That preview URL gets returned. I want to make sure that the status code is 200. It was successful. And then I'm going to turn my response into JSON readable data to make sure that it matches my preview URL. At this point, does anyone have any questions over how to create a test that will mock your API interactions? Go ahead, Brian. Hey, sir, I, I think I understand how to make the test, but I'm kind of questioning the value of this. It looks like all, for all of this code, the test is really just checking within our view that an a get request is being sent. It's not checking that it's being sent to the correct URL. It's not checking that the argument pokeball that we passed in is actually being sent in the get request. Our, our assert equals the two of them on 21 and 22, those would only be triggered if that get was actually sent. But what it's actually asserting equal is that our fake response is 200 and that our fake response content matches the fake response. So, I mean, am I, am I misunderstanding that? No, that's correct. Um, and where the value comes in is kind of at the balance of what you want out of your test. So like I said earlier, there's three types of tests and the test that you were describing that would give us some value is called an integration test where we actually ping the API, get some information back and make sure that that information is correct. That's an integration test. The thing about unit tests is the, this unit test will make sure that my behavior in here is working correctly, right? And that I'm actually iterating through the format of a response that would come back in this kind of format. So it knows that I'm actually grabbing the URL correctly out of this response. That's what I'm testing here. Now, what's the value of this? Unit tests are supposed to be quick, efficient, and very easily executable. So when you run Python managed by tests, it's supposed to happen in a matter of milliseconds, right? All of your tests are supposed to be executed. You get immediate feedback of, hey, this is working correctly. That's the, that's the benefit of unit test. Now, the downside to it is that it doesn't test as far as the integration portion, making sure that the request happened, that it was correct, that the information happened. You kind of have to make a design-based decision as to which test should be integration and which test should stay at the unit level. In this case, we're keeping it at the unit level 
because if we try to make an integration test, it would take a, quite a considerable amount of time. <laughs> Does that answer your question, Brian? <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you very much, sir. Of course. No problem. Go ahead, Tom. So just to, I think I understand, but I'm just trying to get it right in my head. So like if we were doing test-driven development and like we sat down, the value of this would be like, let's say we looked at a new API and we said, I don't know how I'm going to get this data. And then we like did a, you know, a quick API call, and printed it out. We're like, okay, cool. Here's how it's formatted. Would this, would the use for this be like, okay, create the test first, patch it and be like, hey, look, when I run a get request, I want to make sure that my view is putting out what the formatted data looks like when I put it to the console. And then you kind of construct your view and it's like, okay, make sure that everything's returning the way I expect it to come back from the API and then run from there. That's exactly right. Yes. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. No problem at all. Go ahead, Lewis. Uh, I think I understand everything that's going on test-wise, but my one question is what's delineating like this test from just running any Git method we have? Like what's specifying it that it runs this specific get method um, versus like uh, any other one we create? Like what's making sure that this is what's getting triggered? Yeah, exactly. So our client is sending a get request to the noun project API. So that gets, that gets treated as if it were a real request. It will go over to the project URLs, go through this whole process of routing it to the correct URL path. Once it gets to the correct URL part, it'll go to the noun project dot as view. The dot as view will figure out what kind of request it's sending. I am sending a dot get request. So it triggers the get method. And that's how it knows that that's what it's patching. Is that just your okay. question? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. What if, um, what if we had uh, to get methods though for um like this class if that makes sense feel like if the api offered two separate things other than just like um like icons and offered something else we made another get method for it i see so if you had a separate request going out well then at that point you would have two separate helper functions up here and then you would test those helper functions you wouldn't test the get method api so you would import those functions and then or those methods and then test those methods individually in this test suite you wouldn't just try to ping the URL. This is going through the behavior of actually pinging the entire URL, All right? But we want to make sure that we follow the, the single responsibility principle. So for example, here, uh, we have quite a bit happening, right? One, we're making a request and two, we're formatting the response. So this would essentially be two methods that would return at the end of it, one response. Does that answer your question? It does, yeah, thank you. Of course. All right, so now that we covered how to do this, let's actually make sure a test works because I don't think I've ran tests yet. So let's do Python, manage py, test, and let's do API app. All right, it found one test, it ran it, and it came back okay. So let's try to break it now. Let's say that I don't get my thumbnail URL. What will it run this time? Okay, so it gives me a failure. And it tells me, hey, you returned a dictionary named thumbnail URL with example.com at image.png. That's what's happening here. And that is not equal to the string of HTTPS example.com image.png. So now if I revert it and I run it, we can see that it works and it's just returning my actual URL. All right, so now I have my view. I have my test to make sure that my view works. And that is going to be it as far as being able to accept this information. But when I think about it, what is it that this noun project integration is bringing into the table? How could I use it within my Pokemon? Well, if I wanted to use it within my Pokemon, I think that the best way to do it is I would do it to provide icons for whatever type my Pokemon is. So let me change that within my Pokemon. And actually at this point, we've gone over how to make adjustments into our models quite a bit. How do I update my Pokemon model to have a type field and ensure that it accepts only the correct types? 
for actual Pokemon because we don't want this to just be whatever. How do I go about doing that? Go ahead, Adrian. You would go to uh, the serializer, right? And add a field in there. I can't remember the method. All right. So let's uh, open up. Let's see. We'll probably need models. We'll need serializers. And we'll likely need validators. Oh, none of them open next side by side. All right. So let's start at the models level. So here in my models, I have my Pokemon. But I want to add a type field. How could I do that? Go ahead, Adrian. Um, I had my hand open last time. There was someone else that answered. Okay, awesome. Tom? So we just do a, like a type equals model.star field. All right, so let's do a models.char field. And we probably want to put a default here to normal. All right. I do not want to be able to blank it or make it true. I mean, a, a blank it or null it, so we'll leave it for that. But now, how do I validate that the only thing being inputted here is the correct types? That sounds like a validator, right? How could I do that? Oh, go ahead, Landon. Uh, you could make a custom validator in your validators dot py and then uh, import that as a, a validators parameter passed to that variable type. Yeah, that's great. Let's go ahead and oh, excuse me. All right, so let's go ahead and create this validator. We're going to go over to validators and create this validate type. All right, so here's our validators. Let's make this validate type. type. It's going to take in a value. And I don't really remember all the types off the top of my head. So I'm going to go ahead and bring this in from our demos and from our notes inside of the Whiskey curriculum as far as all of the acceptable types. As you can see, there's quite a bit. All right. So there's all of our acceptable types. And now we can say if value dot lower not in, oh, and this dot lower is a method, so I need to make sure I call it, not in allowed types, then I need to raise a validation error saying invalid type. And then finally, I can just go ahead and return my value. Good. So there's my, my validator for my type. I can return it to my models. And I can just go ahead and import it now. So validate type. Let's add that to my type here with the validator's arguments. And that is it. Finally, I can go over to my serializer. And in my serializer, I can go ahead and add type. And I think I'm going to pluralize this and make it types just so that it doesn't cause an issue with naming convention because there is a type, um, I want to say function inside of Python. So let's make it types. Okay, great. Now this is going to get handled in the front end. I could probably use this to uh, make some sort of other requests, or I could try to make my API views forward 
a, the type over to my own request so that I can bring back an individual URL for each Pokemon. Um, or I could actually do that within my serializers as well as to how to serialize types. Maybe I want to make types a method serializer that sends that request. There's a couple of different ways I could do it, but for simplicity's sake, I'm just going to keep the types here and let the front end developer worry about generating those icons for each individual type. So now let's go ahead and make this migrations. I'm going to say Python, manage py, make migrations. Python, manage py, migrate. So that makes all of my migrations. My model has been updated. My validators and serializers have been updated and valid. And everything should be working correctly as far as endpoints. So let's run my server. Now that I have my server running, let's go ahead and utilize this noun project API or this API that we've created to see all of our Pokemon. So there's all of the Pokemon from within my database there. And now they all have their types as well. They all have normal types because I haven't, I haven't changed those just yet. If I take a look at moves, I can get back all of my moves. And if I take a look at my noun and send something like sidekick, Oh, interesting. I get an error here. I wonder what happened. List index out of range. Huh. Well, this is a pretty good example of what could go wrong. Let's see what happens if I do something like fire. Well, fire worked. So there's something specific happening with psychic. Well, let's check that and try to make an edge case for it. Let's go ahead and Pretty print our response here. And I should still get icons. All right, let's try psychic real quick. All right, so I could get a list index out of range. I understand that. And it seems like it returns nothing for icons. Let's take a look at my JSON response purely. All right, so my JSON response on its own returns generated at today, um, at this time, and it returns nothing as far as icons go. So it looks like there is no icons. Go ahead, Kara. It just looks like you have an extra H on the end of psychic there. Okay, let's try that. That makes sense. Okay, so if I do it this way, I still get list index out of range. And if I scroll up to where my request was made, oh. Yep, I sent it for the correct spelling that time. I believe so. Let me double check my spelling just in case. Let's do that. Okay, so I spelled it right. It just looks like the noun project doesn't have something for it. So let's try to test out the noun project. Psychic. All right, so it does come back with something for psychic. So that tells me that there's something wrong with the API endpoint that I'm using. So let's go back to the API Explorer. Let's take a look at icons. So I see this icon, icon ID, description path, but it only allows for integer. So I wonder how it grabs for it.
Okay, so it looks like it's working here if I run into psychic, but it looks like our URL parameter is different. So let me bring it back over. Let me take a look at the difference in between our URLs. Looks like this and limit one might be the problem. Now, when I send my request, I actually get back a psychic URL. All right, and if I type it in, there it is, a psychic hand. Awesome. And that is it as far as integrating third-party APIs. At this point, does anyone have any questions over the last portion that we just covered? I don't really have a question. I just thought it was interesting that that limit caused that error. Yeah, sometimes you can get unexpected behavior. Um, I think that limit was actually doing uh, something that I didn't account for. So let me see. I I agree. I'm a little surprised as well. Yeah, this it looks like this limit is for a results to public domain icons. Uh, but it looks like what I the limit that I actually wanted to implement was down here. So let's do psychic. There's a limit down here. And now if I run it, it returns just one. Nice. So it means end limit one. So there's the issue. I was passing in the wrong limiter and I was reading the API documentation wrong. Yeah. Go ahead, Landon. Is that because maybe the noun project has private and public options for icons? That's why there's two different uh, limiters for the, the responses. And then my second question that uh, was, could you show what happens when you try to return something from the noun project that doesn't exist in the noun project? Yeah, definitely. So as to what's going on here with this limit to public domain, I would have to read their documentation to figure out what this public domain means. But it's likely saying that some of these are public and some of these are not. Um, which means that this one right now that we have back is likely not public. But that would be my my assumption. Very, very big assumption. I would have to read their documentation before I could answer that question. And then as far as what to do if it doesn't exist within the noun project, well, we're not error handling. So this would cause an error, right? Because it's telling you that this response came back incorrectly. So now the way that I could error handle is say if response.status code is equal to 200, then I would like to conduct this information. And otherwise, I would like to return a response saying this parameter doesn't exist within the noun project. And now if I send it, I'm still getting that problem. Let's see what's going on here. All right. It seems like this is failing. So it's returning an empty response. I'm going to be really surprised if it's returning a 200. And let me actually make this string here just so I can separate it. All right, everything's still running pretty well. Let me send this request. Wow, so even if it comes back with nothing, it's still coming back at 200. That is weird. I would, I would hope that they would return a 404, but they did say that their only supported status pose were 200, 401, and 404. So uh, let's go ahead and do a little bit of if statement somewhere else. Go ahead, Tom. 
so right there, if we had something like that, could we just do like if that if that returned list is empty, like if the length is zero, um, then uh, then return like a like a four or response or like return that response we had before that it doesn't exist. I'm sorry, Tom. Could you say that a little louder? I apologize. I couldn't hear you very well that time. My bad. Um, I was saying like so in that case right there. Okay, yeah, because that was kind of what I was saying. Like, if we if we had something like that where it's always returning a two hundred, even if it doesn't exist, do we just like dig down into the data and like, okay, if that list of kind of access is empty, then return the response of like it doesn't exist, or if it does have it, then return the URL. But that was what you went into. Yeah, exactly. So since it was returning two hundred either way, we had to manually check the icons list if the list is empty it will evaluate to false and return the response down there saying this parameter doesn't exist. And if it evaluates to true, meaning it's not empty, it will grab index zero and grab the thumbnail. So now it works and we get this parameter doesn't exist. So does that answer your question, Landon? It does, thank you very much. Of course. All right, any other questions regarding how to integrate third-party APIs? It doesn't seem like there are any other questions. So let's do a quick overview over everything we've done today. Today, we covered why third-party APIs. We covered how to properly explore your API, reading their documentation. We saw a perfect example of how reading their documentation impacts your development just now. Um, we saw how to set up an API app, how to interact with those third-party APIs through requests and handling sequence. We created a .emv file that saved all of our EMV variables. And then within settings.py, we loaded those variables to then utilize that order dictionary to grab individual keys. We then went over formatting responses utilizing Pretty Printer or Pretty Printer. We went over how to change our models to account for type. And we also covered how to mock testing third-party APIs within unit test. At this point, does anyone have any questions over anything that we covered today? All right, I don't see any questions on the chat. I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording.